883, Dr. Janice Todd, please search her on here. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Dr. Todd, do you know why you've been brought before the Psychiatric Science Review Board? Yes, Your Honor. And you understand the implications of this hearing? Yes, Your Honor. I can lose my psychiatric and medical licenses. Good. Now, tell us what the girl. Yes, your investigation of the case of Mary Blanton. This case was referred to by Child Protective Services? Yes, Your Honor. The abuse was first reported on December 3rd. Mary's teacher first contacted CPS about possible abuse on Monday. The case was referred to, referred to me on Friday. Why was it referred to you? You are not employed by the CPS or the state. No, Your Honor, I am not. However, I am the only certified psychiatrist in the area. So once this case was referred to you, you began your investigation? Yes, Your Honor. I first interviewed the family the following Friday on December 10th. Your Honor, I think it is important that you know as a medical doctor, I believe the world to be black and white. All things must be able to be quantified and qualified, weighed and measured, or it does not exist. There are but two things in this world, that which is fact and all else is merely fiction. And things that cannot be counted and numbered are nothing but fictitious beliefs and superstitions. After so many years of working with Child Protective Services, I had seen so much evil in this world. I had lost my hope in the decency and goodness of humanity. After all, all you ever see is evil, that evil is all you will ever see. Evil was there, lurking in every darkened doorway, in every corner, down every darkened alley. The evil of humanity, abuse, violence, neglect, and assault. It was everywhere, and in everyone. Dr. Todd, we are here to find out the truth of what really happened to Mary Blanton. Your philosophical treatise on the state of mankind is irrelevant to our hearing today. Yes, Your Honor. Please forgive me. You wanted the truth. Now, that is an elusive creature. Sometimes I feel like I have the truth. I caught it by the tail, but then it ever so swiftly runs through my fingers, like catching potter in your hand. Truth. Once upon a time, I met a little girl named Mary. A beautiful little girl who was smart and pretty and was being abused. She exhibited all the classic signs. When they sent me the case file, I was so sure that she was being abused in the home by either the mother or the father. After all, almost all abuse takes place in the home by people that abused intimately know. I had all the answers right there in my hand. But the truth that is a bird of a different feather. Why do they keep coming back? They hurt me again. I don't like them, Charlie. Hi, Mary. Can I sit next to you? Oh, yes, Miss Cooper. Were you just talking to someone? Oh, no, just sometimes I talk to myself. Oh, me too. Sometimes it helps me figure out a problem or something that I need to do. Is that why you talk to yourself? I thought I heard you say someone's name. Who's Charlie? We don't have a Charlie in our class. You know, when I was little, I had an imaginary friend named George. But there's no such thing as imaginary people. Everyone knows that. I know that now, Mary. But when I was a little girl, I used to pretend that I had a friend named George. And I would tell him all my secrets. Do you have any secrets you need to tell someone? You can tell me if you like. That's what friends are for. Do you know why I talked to George? Well, no. When I was a little girl, I was very shy. I was so shy that I didn't hardly really talk to anyone in class or play with any other students at recess. My parents moved a lot, so I was always the new girl and never felt like I fit in. So George was my constant companion. No matter where I went, he was the person I could talk to. 
He really was my closest friend. Imaginary people aren't real. You can't talk to them because they're not real. I know that, but it made me feel better to have someone to talk to. It's not much different once you grow up. You know, I'm so glad that I have you as a friend. Because I can talk to you about my feelings, my thoughts, my fears. Mary, would you like to know another secret? I guess. Even though I am all grown up, I still get nervous and anxious. And sometimes it's very hard for me not to be shy. But you're a teacher. You can't be shy. I know, but it's still hard for me. I have to try very hard not to be scared. That's why I'm so glad that you are my special friend. Mary, is there something you might like to tell me? What is it? You know what? Whenever you're ready, just tell me and I'll listen. Because that's what friends do. Would that be okay? Sure. Thank you for being my friend, Mary. Can I get a hug before I go back to class? Mary, is something wrong with your neck? No, it's nothing. I scratched myself. Mary, what, what happened? I told you, I did it to myself. I want to go back inside now. Um, okay. Mary, let's go back in and finish our lessons. Students, it's time to go inside.
on your side of the story. I want to speak to Mary now, so if you please wait outside. Mary, do you know how you got those scratches? Can you tell me how you got them? Can you tell me who hurt you? Why can't you? I promised I wouldn't. Who did you promise? Can you show me what you're drawing? A peacock. Daddy calls me a peacock. Charlie's a peacock. How long have you been seeing Charlie? Miss Cooper seems to think that Charlie's your imaginary friend. He's not fake. I used to go see him at the park with the duck pond. Rosebud pond? Mm hmm Here, I'm done drawing. Mary, what is this picture? It's covered in red crayon. It's Charlie. Mary, is Charlie a red peacock? No. His feathers are blue and green and silver. Then why is Charlie all red? Because it's blood. Why is Charlie covered in blood? Because of what the mean boys did. What mean boys? Just the mean boys. They were older than me. Mary, can you tell me what happened? Charlie? Hi, Mary. Working about this week. I've missed you. I've been busy. Hey, Charlie, would you like a snack? Sure. <laughs> I'm sorry, Charlie. That's all I have. Thank you, Mary. That bird. <laughs> Yo, bro, let's try and catch it. Hey, leave him alone. We'll peck you. <laughs> well, it's practically eight out of your hands. Hey, leave me alone. <laughs> Listen, I've done that bird time for the bro.
Dr. Tower, based upon what we have heard, it appears that you were purposely trying to instigate Mr. Blanton to violence? No, Your Honor. My intent was to apply pressure to gauge his reaction to the allegation of abuse. And this was because you believed him guilty of the abuse? Yes, Your Honor. I thought he was guilty of the abuse. Therefore, the ends justify the means. N no, Your Honor. Dr. Todd, it appears to this court that you were reckless in your handling of this investigation. Your case was flawed and biased from the onset. Your Honor, I admit that I acted in an unorthodox manner, but the evidence presented led me to that conclusion. And what evidence led you to this conclusion? It was Mary's testimony, Your Honor. And these boys in the park, you do not believe they had anything to do with the abuse? No, Your Honor. And the incident in the park, was it real or fiction? At the time, I did not, have, I did not believe it had occurred. Something of that nature would have made headlines in our little town. And this peacock, Charlie, was he fictitious as well? At the time, I wasn't sure of what to believe. Did I believe that he was stoned to death? I was suspicious. I was afraid that Charlie was more than just a peacock, but that he was key to unraveling the abuse. Are you feeling a little bit better now, Mary? I guess. Are you ready for some more questions? I guess. Let's back up a little more story. Can you tell me more about Charlie? He's a peacock. I know he's a peacock. What do you like about peacocks? I used to like them. What was it you used to like about peacocks? I like the feathers. Because of their pretty colors? No, I like the eyes. The eyes on the feathers. Yeah. What was it you used to like about the eyes on the feathers? Well, with that many eyes, nothing could hurt them. No animal could ever sneak up on a peacock because it can see trouble before it gets there. But it's not true. What do you mean? Charlie didn't see those boys pick up those rocks. Mary, did those boys give you the marks that were on your back? No. Mary, this is important. Did those boys hurt you in any way? Well, they hurt me. I hurt my back. And they killed Charlie. When did this happen? Can you guess when it happened? I, th I think it was before Halloween, because I was going to go as a peacock to match Charlie. But, but he died, so I never went. Can you show me the marks on your back? Hitting you with those rocks and laughing. 
I cry and I cry and cry. Well, my silly Mary, as long as I'm here, then I'll always be here. Now, you just lay back and get sweet dreams. And remember that I'm here with you, always. Can you sing to me? Of course. Close your eyes. No. Do you know who did? No. 
Have you ever abused your daughter? No! Who abused you as a child? What? Who abused you? My father. What did he do? Hit me. Knocked me around when he's been drinking. Did he abuse you sexually? No, I said he hit me. And then he would throw me. When I'd be crying on the floor, he would he would kick me. That's what he would do. Do you drink, Mr. Blanton? No. Never. They said that alcoholism is genetic, so I won't drink. I swore I would never become like my old man. Mr. Blanton, abuse is cyclical. The abuse grow up and become abusers. And the cycle perpetuates itself. How dare you accuse me of hurting my daughter? I would never harm her! I love her! Maybe so. What can you tell me about Mary's school? Is she a good student? Mary works very hard, but she struggles some. She sometimes stays after school to get extra help from her teacher. Can you tell me about Mary's friends, teachers, and classmates? She doesn't talk much about her friends or classmates, but she does talk about Miss Cooper being her friend. And Miss Cooper's Mary's teacher? Yes. Mary sometimes stays after school with her to get some extra help. I think she may have even brought Mary home a few times. <coughs> Your daughter's not 
crazy, but there is something wrong. I don't know how or why these marks are appearing. It could be from someone or even from self-harm. But who would hurt our Mary? I don't know, but I need to find out. I would like you to take me back to the night Mary woke up with the most recent marks. What happened? I don't know. It was just a normal night. What about the time before that? Was anything unusual or out of the ordinary? No, it was just like normal. What about the time before that? I don't know. It all seems the same. Every night is the same. Mary plays in her room. Chase and I go to her room to tuck her in. We kiss her goodnight, and then we leave. Then you both leave? Yes. Well, no. Sometimes Chase sings Mary to sleep. He sits in the bed next to her, and he sings to her. Are you sleeping? No. Well, we'll bring her. We'll be back and sing to you, okay? Okay. Mary? 
Do you know what your subconscious is? No. Well, it's kind of like your secret part of your brain. You can do things that we aren't even aware of. Can you see it? No. There is no test that can prove your subconscious is there. But we know that it is. Well then, how do you know it's real? Because we've seen it in action. It's very active in you. In me? Yes, Mary. Your subconscious and conscious are at war with each other. Someone's hurting you, Mary. I told you. It was the nightmares that came to the scratches. No one hurt me. Mary, they hurt you in ways that you cannot see. No. Your mind is blocking out what is happening. So your subconscious has created these nightmares, these monsters, as a cry for help. You are harming yourself as a cry for help. For someone to help you. No, they're real. Mary, I know this in you. The nightmares, the monsters, and even Charlie. But they are figments created by your imagination. No, Charlie protects me from the nightmares. Charlie can't protect you from yourself, Mary. No! Mary, please listen to Dr. Tom. Something is happening inside your head. I must get to the bottom of it. So you will have to start taking this medicine. You clear your mind, and all the nightmares go away. They will go away, and never, ever come back. No! Mary, please! Do you promise that they'll never come back? Mary, I promise. Good. After a few weeks of taking this medicine, you will finally be able to unravel why you are doing, doing these things to yourself. And I promise, you will have sweet dreams, child. Sweet dreams forever. Dr. Todd, you have told a most convincing tale, but you have yet to answer the question. You still have not told the truth about Mary Blanton. You asked about the truth? About who could, who would abuse such a precious little child? A monster of flesh and blood from one of her own design? I don't think we will ever know with certainty. The truth slips through my fingers again. Need I remind you, Dr. Todd, that you are here for alleged medical malpractice and misconduct in the case of Mary Blanton? If you wish to keep your licenses, I suggest you start giving us the answers we want. Give us the truth, Dr. Todd. Life is more than what can be quantified and qualified, weighed and measured. We think that we are so advanced, so smart, no riddle that we cannot solve with science. Truth? There is one truth I now know. The truth is that once upon a time, a beautiful little girl drew me a picture of her best friend, and I took that away from her. I did with those boys. They were good. I killed Charlie. Not with stones, but with science. I killed him where he truly lived, in her heart. And I will live with that shame for the rest of my life. Dr. Tom? I rest my case, Your Honor. Do what you will. All right, Mary, it's time to take your medicine. But I already took it. You have to take it three times a day. But I don't want to take it. Mary, you know that for you to be home, you have to take this medicine. Yes, but where's Daddy? He always touches me and sings to me. He, he has to be away for a few days. But soon, Daddy will be home, and you will be a family. Now lay your pretty head down to rest.
thank you so much for coming out and watching uh, our play. We worked really hard on it. So give these guys a hand again. Um, in case you don't know, my name is Wyatt Palasek. I uh, directed this play with the help of Mr. Mann. Um, and we understand that this play can be really confusing at your first watching of it. When we first read the script as a class, we didn't really have any idea what was going on. Uh, we kind of had to like interpret it for ourselves, and Mr. Mann had to explain it to us. So we thought it would be a good idea to have a Q&A afterwards, see if anyone had any questions about the play, uh, or any questions uh, about any of the characters, or for any of the characters. So we're going to open up the stage or floor for those questions. Did Mary get all right? Uh, no. <laughs> the, the, the short answer is no. She will probably never be alright. She's played by her nightmares forever. It's this They're going to haunt her. House. Now, maybe later on down the road, maybe she'll get some help. Yeah. Okay. The long answer, that's the short answer. The long answer is that she will get better, but she will always have, you know, the scars and always have the problems to deal with, um, which is part of the message of this play. Um, this play's intent is to raise awareness for uh, abuse, child abuse, domestic abuse, uh, because uh, abuse of children almost always happens by the, a person that the abused intimately knows. Uh, and so the purpose of this play is to bring that to light, to highlight it and bring it out for discussion. And so the ending of this play is purposely left ambiguous and uh, left open uh, so that, mm, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. So that uh, you can make your own interpretation of what will happen, you know. Um, and my personal interpretation is that uh, Chase was the abuser, and we tried to highlight that in the play as much as we can. Um, and that, you know, the medication was there to kind of. Uh, help prevent the nightmares, but all it did was prevent her defense mechanism, which is Charlie, and she will still have, uh, maybe not have the nightmares, and maybe not have the self-harm, but she will have the nightmares of permanent emotional and psychological damage. Yes? What were the malpractice allegations? Um, that kind of goes with what I just was saying, so thank you very much for asking that question. Um, the allegations are that uh, Dr. Todd failed to help Mary. Um, Dr. Todd is a very, uh, just kind of like a numbers and data by the book person, and she was a psychiatrist, uh, so she had a medicine focus. And so she just kind of threw medicine at the problem and hoped to fix it, and she did not do that. She uh, simply took away Charlie, as I was just saying. So uh, she is in front of the board for review um, because she didn't do her job right. She didn't help Mary emotionally, you know, which is uh, an interpretation I like to take on the play is that her fatal flaw, essentially, Dr. Todd's fatal flaw, is that she isn't personable enough to help, you know, and so she's kind of, like I said, throws medicine at the problem and uh, she fails to help Mary on a spiritual level, you know, which is where or an emotional level, which is where all of, many of these problems reside. You know, it's not just physiological, uh, as she wants it to be. And uh, so she, there's clear conflict with that in the final scenes, and that's why she's up for review. <coughs> Another interpretation of it is that Mary uh, dies, uh, or becomes addicted to the medication, or um, eventually lives and commits suicide uh, because she can't handle. And, Dr. Todd wasn't there to prevent that, which is an interpretation some of the students had. Um, and it's just one thing I love about this play, is that you can have many interpretations, but also it's good to have a discussion like this, so that people can have their own interpretations. I yes. saw Robert was the last person who had the last line in the play. In my <clears throat> interpretation was that it led you to show you that it was because it was a male. That's just what I have. Well, really yeah. in itself, Robert is an interpretation on its own. Um, I know we don't have, like, I, I think it's printed on the back of the pamphlets, right? What each 
Nightmare was supposed to be, mm. but his character in general was like the embodiment of death. So it really is an interpretation in itself. Yeah. Did she die? Did she emotionally die? And just and you can think shell? about the embodiment of death as like the killing of her innocence. It can be a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Anything could have died, basically. So uh, yeah, the nightmares are each nightmare is a rep is a part of um, Chase and. That Charlie is a part of Chase. Charlie has all the good qualities that Chase has. Because Chase does have good qualities. You know, he is a very gentle father at uh, points in his play. But uh, he also has those horrible qualities. You know, he has the uh, qualities that Robert represents. You know, and so. I also yeah. saw that that was the embodiment of the mother as well because they both sang the same song. To her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Each character in the play has a scene that casts doubt on who the guilty party is. Because uh, each character, you know, sings the song uh, before uh, an abuse, and uh, Miss Cooper even in the uh, the scene in the schoolroom uh, has some key phrases that uh, kind of triggers Mary. So that's one. I have a question way in the back. Some way in the little while. Um, this is for the character of Mary. How did you prepare for this? I don't know. Uh, it just kind of came naturally. That sounds terrible, but it wasn't. It wasn't terribly difficult. You just have to get into the mindset that she's a little girl and she's going through something terrible. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't terribly hard. Also, we have a question right now here. This we've lived this, with this play for a little while, so <laughs> we've gone deeper into it. But we noticed something tonight that we hadn't noticed. The one time when Dad's in the bed with her, Beth isn't there. Yeah. Is that on purpose? Okay. Um, it is on purpose to build suspense really okay. for it um, and to kind of make it shorter. Um, mm. But there is the the point of that is uh, that there's no actual abuse going on in that scenario, but that um, Chase being there kind of brings out the the nightmare. Um, and that is the epitome of that. I mean, not that. Shade uh, Robert is the epitome of that. So that's a really good point. May I insert something? Yeah, go ahead. Um, to kind of go along with what Wyatt said, uh, one of the reasons that Shade, Robert's character, uh, wasn't particularly in that scene is because it wasn't abuse taking place, but uh, we wanted uh, to put the nightmares in that scene uh, to point more towards who the abuser is more than to say, oh, there's abuse going on right now. So I feel like that could be another reason. Yeah. And Robert is kind of like king of the nightmares, and Chase is kind of like king of the nightmares. So it's a, it's a good point to just make him not there in that scene. And the second part, ouch. Dr. Tad, you going to talk about it? We, we've gone round and round on this at home. We're fairly uh -huh. confident Dad did it, Dad's the abuser, and the little girl. Which is why there's an English. Otherwise, nobody would really care. There would be a panel, whatever. But we're also not too sure the panel is real. Yes. But that's all in Dr. Todd's mind and her own. Well, you take me, that takes me to step part that Dr. Todd has actually done to herself than she's in birth party. Yeah, Zemon actually, <laughs> you can go into a second, Savannah, but Zemon actually has uh, a lot to say on that topic. Zemon okay. and I have talked about it. Uh, what? A lot. Uh, yeah, we've talked about it. Would you like to say anything, or can I just go ahead? Just go ahead. Um, yeah, I think that's the All right. Uh, Zemon and I uh, agree that Dr. Todd has done that. Zemon and I agree that it is mostly in her head, and the judge panel is simply just her, her conscience kind of nagging at her because she has the internal conflict of, um, you know, she has failed Mary, which is uh, why I also don't believe that Mary dies in this play. I believe that later on down the road, she very easily could, you know, fall victim to suicide or something of that nature. Um, but we, in the script, in the actual script, we're simply supposed to be shadows behind the screen, uh, which is, goes even further to kind of indicate that we're just kind of in her head. But we like the idea of physically being on stage. Uh, we also didn't have the materials to do the stage. Um, and that's, but we tried to keep the, the voice off stage, um, the voice of the big you know, uh, to kind of like hint towards it. It's just kind of in her head. So then I had something, and then DJ has something? Oh. Um, okay. Um, 
Well, since they asked about that, should we also explain to them uh, the scene in the park? Go ahead. Oh, you want me to do it? Oh, no, man. Well, I'll do it. You know, I'll, do it. I'll just go ahead and explain it. Uh, there was a, uh, we did a performance uh, of this particular play uh, for the school, and one of the students uh, named Isaiah McCurry, McCurry. Uh, had a wonderful interpretation of the scene in the park because there was a debate amongst the judges. Oh, was it fictitious or was it real? Even Dr. Todd was skeptical on that. And Isaiah uh, was supported the belief that it, uh, that it didn't occur, but it was, in fact, uh, symbolism and the boys were, uh, were society uh, condoning? Condemning. Condemning. That's the word, yeah. Condemning uh, Chase. Um, for his for his bad deeds and therefore killing off the good part of Chase that there is left, which Charlie does in fact represent. Yeah, Charlie represents all of the good qualities of uh, you know Chase and some of the good qualities of Mary that uh, protect her uh, from the nightmares. But just as Dr. Todd says, um, the, they're all in her head, so Charlie can't actually really do much to protect her. But in the scene, uh, uh, in the park scene, Isaiah was saying that, uh, kind of connecting it to real world, of how we never really think about the good qualities of an abuser. You know, an abuser is an abuser, and we think of them as 100% evil. You know, which is a really pessimistic view. You know, is it, is it possible that any one person is 100% evil? That no one, but like that they would have no good in them, you know, at whatsoever. And so Charlie, that good of Chase, is being murdered because. Society has labeled him an abuser, you know, and imprisoned him and punishing him, which he needs to be imprisoned and punished. But we also never really think of him as people, too. Yes. Let's go ahead with a different interpretation. That the mother is. Yeah. <laughs> the reason for the inquest is that she put suspicion on her father. The father was removed from the home. And then the nightmares came, and perhaps Mary died. Haven't heard that. At the hands <laughs> of another. Other than outside our shadow. Well, 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 I mean, the nightmares nice. still being there is pretty much them still saying that even though the abuser is gone, which is assumed to be true, even though he's gone, she's still haunted by this. It can't go away. She'll always remember it. So the nightmares are still there. And the medicine may have taken away her protector, but they can't take away the abuse that's already happened and the memories of the abuse that's already happened. That, of course, assuming that Chase was, in fact, the abuser and that yeah, Dr. Yeah, true. Assuming so. Correct. I understand. Uh, correct. It's a bit of a quack, but I actually had that feeling when we first started working on this because I kept thinking about how maybe Charlie is an embodiment of Chase, like fully Chase, and the mother is actually the abuser, and she's the one causing the nightmare. Thank you. Thank you. Right, we have a, a question here and then one right there and then one over there. No question. Congratulations on the makeup. Oh, yes. Oh, that was actually the most obvious. Down here. Find it. That was the work of. We had a question back there. Yes. I'm just going to use the Oh, 
Jack, you're out. The playwriter or the scene composition? Okay. All right, sounds good. Yes? Uh, personally, I really uh, like that aspect of it because it's more as if you're being told a story. It's more um, symbolic because really there is no Mary, there is no Dr. Todd, and it's all about every every uh, victim and every case. And so that way I feel like it's more, um, yeah, it's more as if you're being told a story. And uh, what did you say about how you don't, I, I really like what you said about you don't remember the whole setup of a room, you just remember a table and your parents being there. Yeah, so what we're talking about here is over here in this side of the stage is uh, present day, the, uh, the hearing. And then on that side is a memory of Dr. Todd recounting uh, the events in her office. And then everything in the middle of the stage was a memory in a memory. And because uh, uh, as we go deeper into the memories, it gets more emotional, it gets more stylized, um, and it becomes uh, more focused. And that is why we kind of went with like a, a minimalist uh, uh, setup, like with the schoolhouse, she was just saying it's just a chair and a desk, uh, because you don't remember like every time you get uh, detail. In fact, a lot of times we misremember details. Um, uh, and so that's why it's just a bed, like just a uh, table and chairs in the middle of it, because it's a memory within a memory. Uh, and so that is something that was intentionally done uh, to kind of highlight that. And also, like Rachel was saying, it kind of is a, uh, it's not really a specific story. It's purposely left open ended because it's kind of like a, a fits all, um, you know, story. But that's why there's uh, cast doubt and show so many people and so many interpretations like it might be the mother. Yes? What was the significance of the peacock last night? You said something about Yes. Um, so uh, this is a really fun fact. Well, not fun at all. <laughs> um, it's, interesting. it's an interesting fact. Um, so back in the day, uh, in the same asylums, uh, lobotomy patients were in hospitals with uh, tuberculosis patients. Uh, they would cry out and scream a lot because of the pain, uh, full nature, painful nature of their in illnesses. And so, to counteract that, owners would bring peacocks into the grounds of the, of the hospitals because a peacock's cry sounds eerily similar to a human shriek. I don't know if you've ever heard a peacock cry, but it sounds a lot like a human. And so they would play off their patients who are crying out at night or even in the middle of the day as just peacocks. Uh, and so the cry of the peacock, which is the title of the play, highlights the mental illness that uh, Mary suffers from. And that was intended by the writer. We had nothing to do with it. <laughs> are there any other questions, interpretations, comments? I think you all did great. Thank you. Thank you. We at the beginning of the play and the uh, thing that we mentioned that Calista Dindler helped design all of these wonderful costumes and Davina Walker uh, designed Charlie's costume and made it. So uh, we're very appreciative of that. One last thing. I apologize. Um, uh, I would, well, we would like to acknowledge our drama teacher, Mr. Mann. He allowed us a lot of uh, leeway and. <laughs> They are going to volunteer to stay up here, and Robert is going to come back up here so that you may take pictures. Yeah, I'd like to say something. I'd like to say something. I would like to thank Rebecca for stepping in to the oh, face yes. for tonight. Um, the original actor did a lovely performance for you all.